Welcome, uh, welcome to the day that Ball State knocks off Tennessee in Knoxville in football to open up the college football season. I am Jason Whitlock, your prognosticator, uh, your Ball State football fan. Uh, I'm livid. I'm not going to be in attendance tonight. I'm not, I'm not going to get into why, but you heard me talk about it yesterday. I'm, I'm not going to rant and rave and complain about my first world problems. Uh, but this whole, you know, my car is thrown off my entire schedule and other things. And so I'm not going to be at the game. I'm going to be watching, though. And I can guarantee you this. Ball State's winning tonight. We are going to shock the world, come into SEC country, and knock off Tennessee. Uh, so happy Thursday to you and yours. Uh, hop on that money line. Uh, <laughs> anyway, let me move on to today's show. It's the day before Friday, uh, the day before the weekend, before a long weekend, before Labor Day weekend. I'm excited. I hope you are as well. Uh, we'll be back on Wednesday uh, next week. Uh, so <clears throat> anyway, today and tomorrow, uh, we'll get you ready for uh, the weekend and a long weekend. Uh, fantastic show. TJ Moe, um, not TJ Moe, Steve Kim, St uh, Dave Shannon, and Eric July making his first appearance uh, on Fearless. Eric July of uh, Ripperverse, the comic. We're going to hear his uh, comic book story. He's had a lot of success. We'll hear that at the end of the show. Uh, I'm going to go off again on this BYU situation, uh, but we're going to start uh, with this. Serena Williams is not the greatest tennis player, not the greatest female tennis player of all time. No, she's not. Uh, she won an exciting uh, match last night in the U.S. Open, uh, knocking off the number two, I think, seed, and that is great. I believe that will be her last hurrah. But even if she wins this U.S. Open, Serena Williams is not the GOAT of female tennis. There's a conversation being had, promoted by people. Does she belong on the Mount Rushmore of all-time great athletes, of American athletes? No, she doesn't. Uh, Steve Kim and I are going to talk about this here in a second, but I just want to give you the foundation of my beliefs here as it relates to Serena Williams. Uh, she's a tremendous tremendous athlete, a tremendous story. I love the movie her and Venus put out about her dad. Uh, love it all. Serena Williams is great, but the greatest of all time as a female tennis? No, wasn't available enough. Availability is the greatest ability, and Serena Williams was not available enough. She's won 23 major championships. That's one behind Margaret Court. People are hoping that she wins this U.S. Open and gets to 24, and now she's caught Margaret Court, and now they can argue, oh my God, she's the greatest athlete of all time. She belongs on the Mount Rushmore. People are making that argument. No, I'm gonna, here's who's on the Mount Rushmore of sports. Michael Jordan, Muhammad Ali, Tom Brady, Babe Ruth. That is your Mount Rushmore. I know Jalen Rose says it's racist for me to say Mount Rushmore. Screw Jalen Rose. That's the Mount Rushmore of sports. We're still using that. I don't have a problem with Thomas Jefferson, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, Abraham Lincoln, or who's, is it John Adams or is it Ben Franklin? Yeah, I can't remember who the fourth guy is. Uh, <laughs> George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, and Abraham Lincoln. Anyway, I got no problem with those guys. I got no problem with the term Mount Rushmore. That is your Mount Rushmore. Here's an honorable mention list. For that Mount Rushmore, I'd put Carl Lewis, Joe Lewis, Jesse Owens, Jim Brown, Barry Bonds, Jack Nicholas. That's my honorable mention for the Mount Rushmore of sports. She don't make that. The Mount Rushmore, just during Serena's era of greatness, the Mount Rushmore during the Serena Williams, Serena Williams is 40, her contemporaries are people like LeBron James, Tiger Woods, Tom Brady and Floyd Mayweather. That's the Mount Rushmore of her era. She doesn't make that. Here's my honorable mention list for that list of her era. Kobe Bryant, Roger Federer, Peyton Manning. Screw me. I might put Serena on that honorable mention list. Might, but I won't because she's not the greatest tennis player, female tennis player of all time. Here is my female Mount Rushmore 
Uh, and again, I know everybody, Whitlock's a sexist pig, and, and he's terrible, and he just don't like Serena Williams. Serena Williams is fine, but I'm going to tell you why she's not the greatest tennis player, female tennis player of all time. But here's my Mount Rushmore for female athletes. Jackie joyner Kersey, Chris Everett, Serena Williams, and Martina Navratilova. It's a nice little list. Great female athletes. But female sports have not matured to the point where any of those women rank with the guys. You give guys a 75-year head start, women haven't caught up yet. It doesn't matter how much Title IX steroids they put, put on a deal, it just doesn't add up. As it relates to women's tennis, and why I say Serena Williams is not the greatest tennis player of all time, women's tennis player. When it comes to singles titles, this is just titles won in women's tennis. Listen to this list. Margaret Court, 192 victories. Martina Navratilova, 167. Chris Everett, 157. Billie Jean King, 129. Steffi Graf, 107. Yvonne Gulagong, I think that's her name, 86. Suzanne Lingelin, 81. And then at number eight, Serena Williams, 73. This goes to availability. Availability is the greatest ability. She ain't play enough. And, and not, she chose to have a well-rounded life. God bless her. Hats off to her. It was the smart thing to do. I'm not knocking that. But don't come tell me that you're the greatest of all time when you don't have half as many titles, as many victories, as Martina Navratilova. She's got 167. Serena has 73. That's not half. Margaret Court, who I really don't count, she played in an era, but again, she's got the most major title, 192. Chris Everett has twice as many as Serena. When it comes to finals appearances, listen to this list. Martina Navratilova. 239, Margaret Court, 233, Chris Everett, 226, Billie Jean King, 189, Steffi Graf, 136, Yvonne Gulagong, 119, Serena Williams, 98. Hey man, when you start talking about the greatest of all time, it's about accomplishments. And the accomplish it can't just be reduced to major titles. When we, go when we start, if you want to get in debate about Tiger Woods, Jack Nicholas, and all that, it's going to be a legitimate debate. Tiger's going to have less major titles, but I think he has more victories than everybody except for, why am I forgetting, Ben Hogan maybe? But Tiger's got 82. Once he gets 83, I think he's got the most. But that will be Tiger's argument. He, I got more victories. He was available and winning and won at the highest level on, in all the tournaments. He has an argument. Serena not available. I'm just sorry. And availability matters. It's the greatest ability. You listen to any coach, anybody that understands sports, it matters. So uh, Serena benefits from this woke era of sports media coverage over the last two decades. The fact that she's black puts her on steroids and distorts the entire argument. Serena probably, you know, if I really wanted to be technical and if I really just wanted to argue with you all, I'd have put Steffi Graf ahead of Serena as well. And there's a legitimate case. I think Steffi Graf has 22 majors. Serena has 23. Uh, but Serena gets all these extra credit points because she's overcome racism, uh, according to everybody. And look, did she face some discrimination? Probably, yes. Did people yell things at her? Yes. But who yeah. People yelling at you and being a heel and people not like, that's spinach for athletes. That's, that's extra motivation for athletes. Serena had an enormous athletic advantage over everybody she played against, including her sister Venus. Serena hit the genetics lottery. Not trying to denigrate her, just speaking factually. She hit the genetics lottery. She looks like Earl Campbell. I mean, see, are, are we watching her in this fight? She looks like Earl Campbell out there. I'm not trying to denigrate her, just speaking factually. She's got a genetic talent advantage over everybody she played, including her sister Venus. That talent allowed her to 
mail it in a lot of times, and still win. It's not available enough. And I know people, oh, Whitlock doesn't like Serena Williams. I don't dislike Serena Williams. I'm just one of the few people that will speak factually on Serena Williams. Everybody else is scared. They don't want to be called sexist. They don't want to be called racist. She's, she's ascended into that special place in American society where anybody says anything negative. She can crip walk at Wimbledon. She can crip walk at Wimbledon. And if anybody says a word about it, they're racist. Now her sister was killed by gangbangers, but she can crip walk at Wimbledon. And if you say anything bad about it, if you say it's not classy, if you say it's inappropriate, it's because you're racist. She's lived in that protected space. She's lived that life of privilege. And that life of privilege is why everybody's running around. Oh, she's the greatest of all time. She belongs in around much more. She's better than LeBron James. She's better than this person or that person. And she's, she belongs in around. Take Babe Ruth off. Take Barry Bonds off. Take, take some man off and put Serena on. And it's only because she lives in that protected, privileged space of being a woman and a black woman in this era in America. If you actually go look at the accomplishments, she ain't in the conversation for GOAT. For tennis, she ain't in that conversation. And damn sure, sports all time, she's not in that conversation. Uh, Steve Kim, who's down in Miami, uh, I th are you down in Miami to watch your Hurricanes play football? Is that why you're in Miami, Steve? Oh, absolutely. I mean, big rivalry against Bethune Cookman. I mean, this, this, uh, forget Ohio State, Notre Dame, Cincinnati, Arkansas. I got the Gators getting invaded by the Utes. Bethune Cookman, good football team, better band as the Mario Cristobal era begins anew at Hard Rock Stadium, 330. Had to be here. And you know what? I hate the weather in Miami right now, but you know what they say? You wait 15 minutes going to change. So we're good. So I'm right here in the hotel room. Sorry about all this other stuff here. So anyway. Uh, where do you come down on my Serena Williams argument? Am I too, is she the greatest tennis player of all time? Has she been overrated because she's a black woman? You could be correct in both. I will say this. As a child of the 80s, for me, the individuals like Martina Navratilova and Chris Everett, it's just, it is interesting. When you reach a certain age, things in your era that you grew up as a child will always be better to you, even though that's not the reality. And, you know, Jason, you pointed something out that's interesting. I didn't realize that Martina had won that many more tournaments than Serena. Her consistency for a full decade was incredible. I, I actually used to get into tennis. I mean, look, I'm Asian. I had to, all right? So I just remember her having this incredibly athletic style, and she dominated. Even Chris Everett for a while couldn't really get the best of her for years at a time. And then I remember Steffi Graf, a person you brought up. She was so dominant for about a three-year stretch. If you had a spare 20 minutes, you could literally watch some of her matches in major tournaments. She used to double bagel her opponents, and the matches would be shorter than a 10-round fight. It was amazing. But do I believe that Serena is on the all-time Mount Rushmore for women's tennis? Yes. Her face has to be carved out there. But do I believe that there are certain media members who basically give their version of the Black Lives Matter sign on their lawn to say, hey, guys, please, please don't loot this house. I'm not racist, who automatically start saying that Serena is on the all-time Mount Rushmore for any athletes, period? Yes. Yes, because they're woke virtue signalers. And beyond that? They're gutless. So yeah, I think there's a lot of points here you could point to. All right, let me uh, zero in a little bit. Just for her era as a great athlete, LeBron James, Tiger Woods, Tom Brady, Floyd Mayweather, name me one of those guys that she was more dominant than. Who? That, that's an interesting one, because I actually think your list, and I know you did various ones, were pretty spot on. I have some minor disagreements, but again, we're talking about incremental differences. And God, this is, this is a really tough one, because here's the thing. You go by dominance, and how much do you put in terms of the length of career? Because one of my recent Mount Rushmore, you saying the Serena era, Usain Bolt. 
Uh, to me, he actually made me care about track again. Ooh, I, I that's loved- a good one. That's a good yeah, one. Yeah, but Usain didn't have the longevity of a Carl Lewis, who I believe, and this is going to surprise you, he's one of my favorite athletes of the 80s. There was a time, Jason, growing up in the 80s, every other summer when the world championships would come on with Dwight Stone, and I think the other announcer was Charlie Jones, and they used to show it late at night during the summer. I'd watch every night of it. And I, I grew up knowing who Carl, uh, Carl Lewis was, Edwin Moses, Calvin Jones, all those great sprinters. But that that's an interesting one. Uh, ha, 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 oh, I li- uh, hold on for a second, though. I like other. the Usain Bolt. Hold for one second, Steve. Yeah. I like the Usain Bolt. That's an oversight on my part. He yeah. could crack that yeah. era's top four uh, and certainly belongs on the honorable mention list. Didn't he compete in three Olympics? Though, I mean, when you talk, start saying not the longevity, yeah, I thought he dominate. competed in three Olympics. Okay, but did he win a gold medal in every single one? I, I'm not sure. Yeah, Again, I'm, I'm not I'm, I'm not Dwight Stone here, but when I look at Carl Lewis, this is a guy who could have probably medaled in 80. We boycotted. 84, he won four. 88, he was still dominant. 92, he won a gold medal. And in 96, I think he won a long jump out of nowhere. I mean, for a guy to have that much Olympic success as a sprinter – that guy is on my Mount Rushmore. Bottom line. Uh, 2008, gold in the 100. 2012, gold in the 100. Wow. 2016, gold in the 100. Okay. So and he gold have, in the 200. Okay, then you know what? Point taken. Point taken, but I, I still got to go with Carl because he did more events. Oh, no, no. Look, I, I, yeah. Carl and him are two different eras, and Carl Lewis, to me, is greater than Usain Bolt. That, that's two different, but in terms of Serena's era and, and Usain Bolt's dominance overlapping, yeah, that, that's an oversight on my part. He has to be on that list. Okay, Jason, uh, I got to quibble yeah. with your, pre, or your Serena era Mount Rushmore, and this is going to upset a lot of boxing fans who already hate me. And to that I say, good. Floyd Mayweather. Look, Floyd is not the greatest of all time. He's the best of his era, for sure, in boxing. The difference is when you are in a tournament, you basically have to play who you have to play, no questions asked, and you're generally forced to play different styles consecutively. The problem with modern-day boxing is guys who become draws the way Mayweather was, they can pick and choose. And I thought he was very, very strategic in who he faced and when he faced them. Um, and there are certain guys that he avoided. I can't say in good conscience that Serena avoided anybody. She simply didn't have that luxury. And also, even though she didn't have the busiest of schedules, I know she had some hiatuses, professional boxers now at the world-class level, Jason, and this is one of the reasons why I'm losing interest in the sport, they only fight twice a year now. So how can you really show your greatness over time if you're performing so infrequently and then you have the license to kind of choose who you want to face. Uh, this is not like the era of Muhammad Ali and Ray Robinson, unfortunately. So I, if there is a guy that I would put there uh, and, and replace with Serena, it would be the pretty boy, Floyd Mayweather. Well, no, I would put Usain Bolt in over Floyd Mayweather. <laughs> but okay. Serena doesn't even make my list. I'm hmm. saying she's what? not well, in wait, that now, Russ. It's... That's a little harsh. That is harsh. LeBron James, Tiger Woods, Tom Brady, Usain Bolt. Which one is she better than? No, but it's, but did you just say she doesn't make your honorable mention? No. Well, she's not not on this list. But I, I you know, I, I, wow. I know I'm a little on a little shaky you ground know, there. You know, Jason, Kobe I Bryant, you, Kobe Bryant, okay. Roger Federer, Peyton Manning, Usain Bolt. That's my honorable mention. Look, you know what's funny. I thought the most offensive thing you said about her was comparing him to comparing her to Jerome Bettis. This might be worse. Now, with that said, you have a point. On fourth and one, I'd give her the old belly series right up the middle. She would move the chains, but cheap shot, Jason. Cheap shot, man. Wow, cheap shot. Speaking of cheap shots, uh, I don't. Did, did I run off my list of female Mount Rushmore honorable mention? Did I did I say that list? Uh, no. Florence Griffith Joyner. Uh, Caitlyn Jenner, Caitlyn Jenner, and Aaron Andrews. Aaron Andrews. I I don't. Okay. The work she did on the sidelines in college football, I think, puts her on the the Mount Rushmore. Yeah, you're going to get in some some trouble with a certain community over uh, Jenner. 
Okay, yeah, that 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 right there. I just want everyone to know that the the what pronouns does what pronouns does does he use? I mean, I just I, I'm being accurate here. In 1976 in Montreal, it wasn't that one. Uh, also, the thing with Flojo, she had a great summer. I actually know a little bit about Flojo because given my relationship with Victor Conte, yes, that one from Balco, who's educated me a lot on the whole track circuit and that culture. Flojo is interesting because I remember in 1988, the one female sprinter that I knew was not any of the joiner curses. It was actually Flor- it was uh, Evelyn Ashford. Because I, I, so for some reason, I just love the name. I think she went to UCLA, and she's an all-time great. So in 88, all of a sudden, this lady that looks like Janet Jackson with one legging is just blowing out the field by three lengths out of nowhere. And my understanding was, Steve, she was always a world-class performer, but she'd always come in fourth or fifth. But then all of a sudden, with these diva-like looks, she was very elegant and just coming out of there like Carl Lewis of the females. I was like, wow. And she was the star of that 88 Olympics, I remember. But again, when we talk about longevity, I'll say it again. She had a great summer. There was actually no career after the 88 Olympics. So, look, I'm a, I'm a Flojo fan. God rest her soul. But I think longevity has to matter, Jason. It does, but you got to remember, women's sports just don't have the history. So I would, co- it's like why Gail Sayers is in the Hall of Fame and got in first ballot because he, early in the yes. history of the Hall of Fame and professional football, he had a brief flash of, and they put him in the Hall of Fame. If he had that brief flash now, it would take a lot longer or he may not even make the yeah. Hall of Fame. He may be looked at. Uh, what's the, the Chris Johnson? Is that the little running back? Oh yeah, play for had two thousand yards for the Titans. Yeah, he he might Jason, be that guy rather than Gail Sayers. Here's a name that I brought up, and I, I was tempted to at least mention him as an honorable mention. And I think he's as good an athlete as I think we will ever see, and he's once in a two lifetime type of guy, Vincent Bo Jackson. This is a guy that was an all-star caliber baseball, and that is a sport, and I played that at a very mediocre level, how he was able to actually do that and really develop his skills by his third, fourth year where he was an all-star. And then literally just kind of put on the pads for a week or two, starting in mid-October, and then bust off 80-yard runs is amazing. What about him? Stay. 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 What? I'm, I'm just – they're just now showing me – the Steve Kim Mount Rushmore. Right. And the hell of a list. Because they're showing me you got Bo Jack. First of all, if Bo Jackson's honorable mention, you're you're slapping yes. Deion Sanders in the face. So Deion be it. Sanders would have to be that guy okay. over Bo Jackson. He did Big but, but, but regardless, regard Steve Kim's all time Mount Rushmore is Michael right. Jordan, Muhammad Ali, Carl Lewis, and Babe Ruth. Right. What's wrong with that? That's the fearsome force. Tom Brady. Tom Brady has to be on this list, Steve. No, that no. is absolutely ridiculous. The man has seven Super Bowl titles. He, he played does. the only sport that really matters. He has to be on this list. That's like leaving George Washington off the original Mount Rushmore. You can't leave the founding father off the Mount Rushmore. Look. Tom Brady has to be on this list. Let me rebut that. That that okay. Look, there's Tom Brady in my top ten. Yes, but eras and style of play matters. And to quote the great Jack Lambert, the philosopher of football, the middle of the steel curtain, he once said, "What do you think about the rules for today's quarterbacks?" And he said, "As only he could, you ought to put a dress on him." So sorry. Out of those four guys, who do you put above my four guys for Tom Brady? All right, I'll give you. I'll I'll, I'll entertain this. Do you take him over Jordan, the greatest, Carl Lewis, or the Bambino? No. Which one? Which one? No, I, I take him over Carl Lewis and Babe Ruth. Oh, no. 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 But uh, let me tell you why about Babe Ruth. Because oh. I had a very hard time between Babe Ruth and Barry Bonds as someone representing baseball. I'm, but, I'm just sorry. Barry, Babe Ruth played before integration. He didn't play against true. the best competition that was out there. And, okay. But I still put him on the list. I was, the guy was a pitcher, a slugger. Again, I'm not going to denigrate him, but he's, to me, 
the sketchiest choice out of anybody. And now you've snuck Carl Lewis in there. And, and, and so I, I love Carl Lewis. And, and he, if he had broke Bob Beeman's record, he'd probably be uh, on my list. But he never got it done. He should have smashed the 200 meter record. He could have done it in Indianapolis. I was in the stadium. The guy pulled up 40 meters from the finish and started throwing his hands up and coasting. And if he had just run through, he would have run like a 19.40 or something in, in whatever year that was. I was just a college kid, so that had to be uh, late 80s, early 90s, some point in there. Anyway, uh, Jay, Tom let, let Brady, come that. on, man. Tom Brady's got yeah. seven Super Bowls, man. Let, let me rebut that. First of all, Barry Bonds is the best baseball player of my lifetime. There's no doubt yeah. about it. However, there's an inconvenient truth here as I go Al Gore. Um, the only only supplement that Babe Ruth was on was hot dogs. I'll just leave it at that. Now, as it relates to Carl Lewis, I mean, there's other things. He had one of the top five high top fades of the 80s. It was aerodynamic and fashionable. Now, if he would have done one more national anthem, he would have been off my list. But no, he knew what he was. The guy would have won medals in five Olympics if we did not boycott in 1980. That cannot be overlooked, Whitlock. No, not doing it. I'll say this. I'll say this. If Carl Lewis were competing in this woke era, and given the fact that he was on the cover of a magazine wearing high heels and stockings uh -oh. uh, at some point, mm. if he mm. were competing in this era, he would be getting the Serena Williams treatment, and we would be calling him the greatest of all time. And he'd be on the cover of every magazine, and Stephen A. Smith and Bomani Jones and all the woke sports writers would be out defending him. And, and uh, so, you know, Carl Lewis was ahead of his time. If he knew this woke era was coming, he probably would have come all the way out and, and would be celebrated as the greatest athlete of all time. And, and I'm telling you, I loved Carl Lewis. Not trying to take a shot at him. He was one of my favorite dads. Following his track meets, I'm I'll never forget the day I was in Indianapolis, watching him long jump, watching him run the 200 meters. It's one of my great sports memories, because we had a great track in Indianapolis uh, at that time, maybe one of the fastest tracks in all the world. Uh, but a little ahead of his time. Maybe, maybe he'll do what uh, Caitlyn Jenner did, and. You know, no, don't give him flowers, any. Don't give him give, any. Get his flowers uh, in, in, in the latter stages of his life. Uh, Jason, uh, before I get out of here, I don't know when you're going to end this, but I want to make this clear. I am very excited to hear your conversation with Eric July of the Ripiverse. I'm actually a fan of his, watched a lot of his videos, and you're going to love this, and I think he'll love it too. I have not bought a comic book since Calvin and Hobbes and the Peanuts, okay? I decided to support his business. And I don't know if I'm ever going to read it. It's not really up my alley, but I, I love the fact that he's just a go-getting capitalist who's a disruptor. Uh, I ended up actually supporting his cause, and I will have a copy of the Rip Reverse episode one. So I, I'm looking, I'm looking very forward to your conversation with him. I'm a big fan. Love to hear that. You got to stick around. I'm going to talk with Dave Shannon. We're going to talk about this BYU stuff again. X. Welcome back. Uh, we're going to go out to Idaho and bring in Dave Shannon. Dave, I, I'm just going to bring you in quickly. It's going to take me a second uh, to set up this conversation, but I did just want to say hello. I wanted to see what you were wearing. Uh, you got your tie on today, so you must mean business. Uh, but anyway, Dave, sit back for about three, four minutes as I kind of set up our conversation and unpack it. Uh, this week, we've been talking about... Um, <laughs> we've been talking about the BYU uh, potential racial hoax. And yesterday on the show, we had those kids on uh, from the Cougar Chronicles. They started their own little media outlet at BYU and they kind of disputed the facts as it relates to this BYU 
Duke volleyball match and all the racial slurs. And anyway, two of those student journalists we had on, uh, the kids made reference to something called the Black Menaces. And if you watch the show, I was listening, the Black Menaces, what are you talking about? There's a group called the Black Menaces? What, what, what is that about? And, and so after the show, last night, today, uh, th this morning, I started doing homework on the Black Menaces and trying to get to the bottom of what, what are the Black Menaces. And it's five kids at Brigham Young started calling themselves the Black Menaces. I believe BYU has uh, 30, 35,000 students, maybe two, three, four hundred black students at BYU. Schools located in Utah, it's a Mormon college, are dominated by Mormons, dominated by white people. I think Utah, maybe one percent of the population is black, 80, 85 percent of the population is white. Uh, most of it's Mormon, and so Brigham Young, reflective of that, not a, many black students at BYU. And so five of those students started something where they call themselves the Black Menaces, and they go around uh, doing interviews uh, trying to embarrass uh, some of their white peers. They have a TikTok page. Let me see if, I, yeah, I still got the TikTok page called up. They have a TikTok page that has 725,000 followers. And uh, it says their mission changing predominantly white institutions one day at a time. The black menaces. And so I want to show you, we got three different little clips from the black menaces where they're one, I think we'll start with the first one where one of the leaders of the black menaces is giving his statement or his version of what happened at the BYU Duke volleyball game. Let's watch that clip. Hi, it is the Black Menaces. And we're upset, angry, disturbed, disappointed um, at what happened at the BYU versus Duke volleyball game. If you don't know what happened, here's what happened. This is Rachel Richardson. She is the only black starter for Duke's volleyball team. And while Duke was playing BYU in her volleyball game, Every single time she was served, she was called the N-word with the hard R. She was also threatened by a white man and nobody did anything. The most that they did was put a police officer to sit next to the, the person that was calling her the N-word every single time she served. We are so upset by the apathy that every single person in attendance at this game showed. There was 5,000 people. This includes the coaches who didn't say anything, both teams who didn't say anything. This includes everybody in the stands who didn't say anything and the people in the student section right next to this person who didn't say or do practically anything. At what point will white people at BYU and across our country fully start sticking up for those who aren't like them? At what point Will they call out racism when nobody's there to do it for them? We are calling on BYU and everybody in attendance with this letter. Pause to read. We are calling on BYU to work with the black menaces to create and implement a mandatory anti-race training for the staff, faculty, and administration, and every single student to root out internal racism and learn how to properly respond in these situations. We have to take action and we have to do it now. So <clears throat> I wanna start here with the, a group calling themselves the Black Menaces and their kids and, and, but again, this is just stupid. And it's, it's, you guys get tired of hearing me use this word, satanic, but it is. We have our best and brightest young people going off to college because this whole Black Menace thing at BYU started in February and it's now taking root nationwide. It's spreading to other college campuses. They got t-shirts that say, be a menace. So let's just start here. What is a menace? And we'll go by the dictionary. It's a good source. Something that threatens to cause evil, harm, injury, etc., a threat. Our kids are running around calling themselves menaces, the black menaces. 
We all know what would happen if there was a group called the white menaces that went around changing predominantly black institutions or historically black universities and uh, colleges and universities. We all know what the reaction would be. They would be treated like the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers. This is racist, what they're doing, plain and simple. And, it, and it's stupid. And it's, again, as I've, I've said, uh, say 10. But it's also a money-making scheme, and there's an industry being created that this kid, he's just a pawn in it, uh, being used by people above, uh, that are making money off this. We're calling on BYU and all universities to hire people to come in and teach us how to be anti-racist. That's the new industry that's being promoted here. Have black people come in and teach white people how to treat black people. And the black people get to be judge and jury on how they're treated and they get to decide which word that day is offensive to them and what tone and blah. And the guy, you get to make up your own facts. This guy wasn't at the volleyball game, but he's certain that everybody else in that building, because again, he said, the coaches, her teammates, coaches on other teams, students, no one did anything. It didn't cross this kid's mind. It didn't cross a black menace's mind that perhaps no one did anything because no one heard anything. That's more likely than for someone to be yelling at a teenage girl at a softball, I mean a volleyball match. That's more likely that no one heard anything than 6,000 people sat in a building and listened and heard someone yelling uh, profanities and the N word with a hard ER, according to this kid who wasn't there, but he's certain and he's repeating. Because Rachel Richardson, a 19 year old girl, because she said so, it must be factual and true. She has descended from the heavens, an angel. She's incapable of lying. This whole, this is the mentality, and I'm about to say something very big here, but this is the mentality that led to Emmett Till getting lynched in 1955. White racists used to think and talk the way this black kid at BYU is thinking and talking. Oh my God. A white woman said that a black boy mistreated her. Let's don't second guess anything. Obviously this is a white woman. She's descended from heaven. She can't be, uh, she can't be mistaken. She can't be wrong. It, oh my God, she was violated. A young black boy whistled at her, according to her, let's go out and do harm to this person. This is the same mentality. Here's a black kid that wasn't there. Oh, there's a 19 year old black girl who descended from heaven. There's no way she's lying, exaggerating. There's no way she misheard anything. All, everybody in that building is a racist piece of scum. And they end up accusing a young white boy who is special needs. That's who they accuse of this crime. I'm talking about the young black girl, Rachel Richardson. This kid, they have an awkward moment with a special needs kid. And oh my God, I felt threatened. A white man came up and threatened me. And I felt. Let me ask y'all something, honest to goodness, and maybe I don't follow volleyball close enough, but I have followed sports very closely. Have we ever heard or seen, and I'm doing this off the top of my head, I haven't done the research, but I've been involved in sports a long time. Have we ever heard of a college athlete harmed by a college sports fan inside of an arena? Have we ever heard of it? I'm doing this off the top of my head. Maybe there's a million examples that I cannot think of. But I would like to know in what world, in what reality, Rachel Richardson and all these, oh my God, a white man threatened me and I felt unsafe and BYU didn't do, do anything to protect me. You would almost think 
that she was playing this volleyball match at a playground in South Central LA. Because there's plenty of history of young black boys and girls being harmed on playgrounds in South Central LA. I'll connect it to this, what we were talking about in the A Block, about Serena Williams. Go watch the Serena Williams movie and see what happened to her dad. Uh, what The movie they made about her dad, uh, about Richard. King Richard, thank you. King Richard. Go look what happened to him, them in a playground. But on a college campus? Are there examples of this that I'm unaware of? Help me out here. I'm t jump in the chat right now. Jump in the comments. If you're watching on YouTube, send me an email, fearless at theblaze.com. Maybe there's a whole laundry list of examples where college kids are getting beaten up, violated at college athletic events. I'm not aware of any. So I don't know why this young woman felt scared because she had an awkward moment with a special needs kid. Really? Again, I went to junior high, elementary school, and high school with special needs kids. Awkward moments with special needs kids. And again, I know I'm old and this is a long time ago, but we had awkward moments with special needs kids. I never felt violated, never felt unsafe. Many of you watching in the audience, they called it the short bus or whatever. You had awkward moments with those kids. I never felt unsafe. This woman is exaggerating and lying. Anybody with a brain can see it, but the black menaces are promoting this as a race crime. This is racism. These are young people taking on a name that's something that threatens to cause evil, harm, injury, et cetera, a threat. And we're doing nothing about it. No one's objecting. Our best and brightest kids are, are calling themselves the black menaces. And they're harassing white kids and, and black kids on college campuses trying to get them involved in embarrassing videos they can put out on TikTok. That's how they're making money and building a following. And we're good with this. Oh, this is fine. We can be menaces. We can call ourselves the black menaces. I'm sorry, this is not Dennis the Menace. This is people calling themselves the black menaces trying to run around and embarrass people over TikTok, over China's social media app. They're trying to divide and tear up this country. I want to play uh, another clip. That I think it's the first one where he, said, where he sticks a microphone in another kid's face and tell us about your racial experience in life. And he, just tell us. Tell, tell us how you've been made a victim. Play that clip. All right, Nate, so tell me, tell me your racist experience that you've had in life at BYU, either way. Ooh, I got a couple. All right, so when I was nine years old, I was sitting in Sunday school at church, and one of the kids in class asked if I would be white when I, was, when I went to heaven, and the teacher chuckled and said he didn't know. And let me see, at, on BYU campus, there's another one, I was in church, and um, they had just called like a new ecclesiastical leader, a bishop, if you will, and it was a white man. So me and my, my friends were kind of upset about that. And we asked another ecclesiastical leader, he was like a higher up in the church. We asked him, um, why aren't there, why isn't there more representation among the leadership in the church? And he said, Brother Bird, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And we hated that. And then uh, third example, when I was a freshman here on campus, I was walking down the street over by the stadium and some dude on a motorcycle shouted the N-word at me as he drove past on his motorcycle. So, you know, good times at BYU. There you have it. That's, that's two black young men sounding like two pansies. Sounding like eunuchs, ballers, 
dickless. The unsullied. If you watch Game of Thrones, they've cut our balls off. And this is what our, our young men are doing. Sitting around, tell me about your racism and the things. <clears throat> you got so little going on in life and you think so little of yourself that any little encounter you had with white people leaves such a devastating impression on your life that you, oh my God, let me tell you about this one time when I was nine years old. And a white boy asked me if I was going to be white in heaven. And, and these people think they're the blackest people on the planet because we've been convinced, our young people have been convinced that being black means being a victim of something white people did to them. And so as a nine-year-old boy, it leaves such an indelible mark. Oh my God, <laughs> White boy asked me if I would be white in heaven. I've never recovered. You're so filled with racial idolatry that as soon as someone's named a deacon or a bishop or whatever they're called in the Mormon church, your first thought is, oh, what color are they? Not whether they're going to be a good bishop, deacon, priest, what I don't... I'm sorry, I apologize, I don't know the Mormon religion, whatever the position he was talking about, the man got. You're not concerned about whether he's gonna be good at the job, you're worried about what color he is. And oh my God, he wasn't the right color and that just left a mark on me. Me and my friends, we were so upset. Move out of Utah then. This is what kills me about black people. Oh, I can't stand white people, but damn it, I'm gonna move to their neighborhood, I'm gonna move to their state, I'm never gonna leave, I'm gonna go to Brigham Young University where there's only 200 black folks. I will not spend my money and go to a black university. No way in hell. Got to be around white people. And I got to be complaining about it. That's a choice. Love the fruit, hate the tree. You, can't, you couldn't think of existing without being next to some white people, but then you want to spend your whole life complaining about it. This is what we're doing to our young people. We're turning them into little girls. Sitting around gossiping and bitching and complaining about nothing. And we're not even offended. We think this is manly. Oh my God, they're speaking truth to power. They're on TikTok whining about what white people told them when they were nine years old. They sound worse than Rachel Richardson. She's a girl. She, I, if she wants to whine like a little girl, fine. MSNBC, and Dave, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to take this long, but MSNBC then put one of these clowns on TV uh, to celebrate because then, again, and getting interviewed by some black woman, and, and they just, we need to quit having these barbershop shows and have black women have beauty salon shows where they interview these young black boys that they're transitioning into womanhood and call it the beauty shop. That, that's LeBron's next show needs to be called the beauty shop instead of the shop and let one of these black women host the show and have all these little young boys sitting around getting their hair braided, getting buns put in their head, getting tatted up and all that and let the women sit around so they can sit around and gossip and talk about all oh, the tragedies they've experienced when white people didn't say the right thing to them. The beauty shop brought to you on HBO. Because that's what this, sh MSNBC's already got it. They had, she, the transitioning process, I think this woman's name is Zerlina or whatever, she had this one of the black menaces on her show doing the beauty shop, and they, they just two girls sitting around gossiping about white folks. Let's take a listen.
this for this conversation. I mean, one of the things that you say in the videos and it's the point that you all make um, a lot is this idea that people grow in discomfort. And this is my mm. jam, which is why I said that if I was in college and TikTok existed, <laughs> I would be doing exactly what you're doing because I believe, I, I truly believe that people grow when you sort of have to make them shift in their seat a bit. When you sort of say, Absolutely. did you really just say that? Did you really just say that? You just repeat back to them what they said and, and they're like, whoa, I didn't mean it that way. Like, make them confront the racist microaggressions and some of the things that they're doing. I mean, why do you think that's so important? I think it's so important. Well, Utah is 80% white and 1% of it is black. At BYU, 0.44% is black. So about 200 students out of 35,000. So the average BYU student has a lack of understanding about black people. And then when you're Mormon, you have the racist ideologies that are perpetuated within the church. And so if you're not becoming uncomfortable and stepping out of yourself, mm -hmm. then you'll never, never, never grow or become an anti-racist as one where in Utah and in a country fueled by white supremacy, then you can't. You're watching a sex transition surgery in real time. Zerlina, whatever, I think her last name may be Maxwell or whatever, she's transitioning, discipling that young man into womanhood in real time. If I was on a college campus, I would be doing the exact same thing y'all doing. That should have been the first sign to that young man. This woman just told me that what I'm doing is what she would be doing. Hmm, I wonder if I'm doing the right thing. If you, Trust me, young man, the next time any woman sits in front of you or has you on TV and say, let me tell you something, baby boy, if I was on a college campus, I would be doing the exact same thing as you. I would drop to my knees, bend over, and let him just ram it right up me. That's your sign that what you're doing is wrong and that you're being transitioned in real time. Why are we putting up with this? And I'm sorry, this... Dave, you gotta help me out here because I, I, re I didn't plan on this, I didn't plan on getting this emotional, but again, re-watching this stuff that I looked at it this morning, I was just, this is crazy. What is going on with us? The black menaces, that's, that's, that's the next iteration of Black Lives Matter? That our kids, our best and brightest sitting going off to college, this is what they're spending their time on, trying to menace white people? They have nothing better to do? They don't have a group called Black Excellence? Black Champions? Black Victors? Black Conquerors? Black menaces signed off. Of, oh, if I was on campus, I'd be doing it too. I'd run around and just menace white people because we got to make them uncomfortable. That's what you got to do. Make them uncomfortable. I'm trying to stay somewhat biblically sound and just not throw away all the progress I've made. But at this point, I've told y'all this before. My favorite rapper is Tech Nine. He made a song called Mitch Babe. And he made it 20 some odd years ago. That's, that's, it's the most prophetic song I've ever heard in my life. And it's vile and it's profane, but this, we're living in the era of Mitchell Babe. Move the M and the B, and it'll tell you what the song is about. Bitch made. Dave, I'm sorry for cursing. I'm sorry for bringing you into this. Uh, Dave, are you there? And, and help me out here. W what is going on, man? Am I just here to say amen? Because it's not going to get better. That mean, you were killing it. Uh, there's a couple things, Jason. I, I, there's a couple things you said that I think are really, really important. I don't think people should miss the point that you were making about Emmett Till. That is a very, very massive point. The same thing that got us Emmett Till is the same thing that will happen on the other side of this because we are missing something very important, which is the process called due process. That whole situation with BYU, 
we got the lynch mob way before we decided to do the investigation. That should make everybody concerned because it, it's not about race at that point. It's about the mob that's in power, that's in control, gets to decide who lives and dies without any sort of checking to corroborate the story, to make sure that we have the facts and the truth, and then to make an assessment of the situation. More than one witness, right? That's a biblical standard. A uh, biblical standard says we want more than one witness to corroborate the story, to understand what actually happened. And then on the other side of it is, yeah, I, I, I think what would have happened or what people wanted was let's find the guy, let's bring him out to the middle of the whole situation and let's flog him in front of everybody. Would that have been just... No. The other thing I, I have to p take a, a little bit of a, a, a problem with you on is I don't think this is our best and brightest that we're looking at, Jason. I just I just can't believe that. I can't believe that our best and brightest are doing this. I think it, because they aren't our best and brightest, this is why we have this. These are the guys who can't really cut it in the real world and real life. So they have to create some sort of other industry in order for them to be able to make it to get the attention that they want. One thing we need to make very, very clear, TikTok warriors would not inherit the earth. The world isn't designed that way. They, people who are keyboard warriors and TikTok warriors and Facebook warriors won't inherit the earth. That's not how God has designed this to happen. These people, to me, are are a symptom of, of, of a bigger problem. You know, you're talking about black excellence. Why come we can't have that one? You were talking about... Um, uh, uh, black greatness or whatever, just all sorts of other terms outside of black menaces. But the problem that I think is with that is that it still has the same problem as black menaces because it has the word black in front of it. The problem is the virtue is put in the wrong place. How do you get black menaces? Because you put your virtue in your blackness instead of having an alien virtue that is given to you from God. So then you have to have black this and black that and black everything else instead of saying, my virtue is given to me from God. And since I'm made in the image of God, I act in a way that says everything that is made in the image of God has virtue, has value, has beauty, has greatness, right? Because it's about the image of God inside of man, not just the fact of his skin color. There isn't any more virtue in my skin color than another person's skin color. And so we have to remember the way that we get Black menaces is that parents have embraced an ideology and a worldview that says the most valuable part of you, son, daughter, is your blackness instead of the fact that you are made in the image of God. God made you. You bear his mark, not the fact that you have black skin or you're a person of color or indigenous. No, you bear the image of God, and that's where your value comes from. God says you are to be like me on earth. Therefore, inherent value placed inside of you. Dave, I, I feel like someone that was on life support and you just came in and pumped my <coughs> chest, gave me some CPR, breathed some life. Because I, 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 I'm telling you, man, I look at this and, and I just I get hopeless. Like. Th these are what. Our educated kids are doing, and this is what the culture is supporting and acting like this is what we're supposed to be doing. And, and, and I just need that reminder. I'm so glad you stuck with me and were able to join me today because I, I got to hear that because I'm getting really despondent and depressed because this story was so bogus from the get go. Anybody that just heard, I'm like, hold on, man. They had a religious university, and we really think five, 6,000 people were in a building, and someone's chanting the N-word or whatever for two hours. And, and then by the time you looked at this woman's godmother, the Lessa Pamplin or whatever, out of Texas that wants to be a judge, and her Twitter feed is filled with racism. Her godmother, the, the woman on the left, is filled with racism. Anti-white racism. It's everywhere over this woman's Twitter feed. She said it to private. You can't find it now. She's probably erasing everything. But, but th that's where, again, I go to, this is like Emmett Till all over again, except the, the, the roles have switched. The, yep. the, the, oh, well, here's proof that her family's racist. And so now we're wondering how this little 19-year-old girl, what would be her motive for telling this lie? Well, her family's racist, and 
they look to stir up racial animus based on her godmother and, and who wasn't there, who was the first, her father who wasn't there, who's backed up. Oh, th this is like a game of telephone that the daughter called the godmother and the father and said one thing and then they exaggerated and the godmother put it out on social media and the father's on, and the media is just reporting all this stuff as fact when there's just no proof and, and just like you said, they've gathered up a lynch mob, Stephen A. Smith, LeBron James, and everybody. And, and, and the lynch mob is, as the facts come out, and it's clear as day, we're looking at a, a white version of To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, the facts are out, and, and, and we're trying to lynch, what was it got? Tom Robinson, I think his name was, in To Kill a Mockingbird or whatever. We need Atticus Finch. I, I'm, anyway. We're looking at, and Stephen A. Smith and he's got, they're doubling down. They're, they're double, rather than, hey, I was wrong and let's be fair, they're, they're doubling down. This was a special needs kid that they tried to put in the crosshairs of this. Oh yeah, he's the one that did it. His, there, I, I recognize his voice. Special needs kid. This, this is evil, man. And, and uh, so please, if you could one more time, pump my chest and try to breathe life back into me because I need it, man. Well, you know, Jason, there's a couple things here. I think that people have not been paying attention to the world right now. There is a stench of white guilt that permeates America in such a way that the new white kids of this generation are, they hate their grandparents and their great grandparents, that they never want to be like them. In a room of roughly 5,500, 6,000 people, um, it's hard to believe that people who have this white guilt manipulation that's permeating the culture that they're soaking in would really allow something like that to happen. They would say, oh, look, you're just like your grandparents. You're letting this guy sit up here and yell the N-word and you're not doing anything about it. I was on a plane and the lady, the stewardess, wouldn't let me go to the bathroom, Jason. And it, she was yelled at me and told me to go back and sit in my spot. And I'm like, lady, I got to go to the bathroom. And all of a sudden, all these white folks got up and started saying, how come he can't go to the bathroom? Let him go to the bathroom. Because they thought that she was being racist to me because I was a black man. And she's trying to tell them, no, I can't let anybody go at this point in time in the flight. And so I'm trying to tell them to go back. We just had some security issues. But they all thought it was racist. And out of nowhere, they're running to my aid on a plane to be able to say, she didn't call me the N-word. She just told me I couldn't go to the bathroom. And these white these white people were so felt so guilty and felt so ashamed about past stuff that they didn't want to be the people in the moment that didn't say and do anything. That's the point that we're at in the culture. That's the tone and the temperature right now. What's scary about that is that people can take and create false moments to move that group of people who are trying to be good to do things that are wicked. That's what's really, really scary right now. You have a group of people who want to be good, who are trying to do the right thing, and that guilt that they have is being used to manipulate them to create something that we don't want, which is the lack of due process in the lynch mafia. The other thing, Jason, that, that really bothered me about the black menace stuff, menaces stuff, um, was that the we always have problems in culture and society. There's always going to be a serpent in the garden. There's always going to be a, a bad guy. We're always going to have some sort of infiltration of wickedness. But I don't think that we have an immune system to be able to fight that type of wickedness. Now, that you don't talk about being scared. That scares me because I'm watching the kids that are answering the questions on BYU University. And I'm like, now, I know that you guys have a strong moral standard. But I didn't see one. <laughs> I didn't see. I saw them as compromised as the kids who are answering the question. And I'm saying, wait a second. I know that black menaces is a problem. But if we don't have an immune system to be able to fight that kind of problem, whether it's the kids on the campus who are answering black menaces or the, the people who are willing to be manipulated by the other uh, this group, we're going to be in. That's the part that scares me. We're going to be in trouble because the the civil rights movement at least had an immune system to say, wait a second, this person is made in the image of God. You believe that. Act accordingly. And so I think that we're destroying our immune system because of the guilt manipulation instead of finding our, our forgiveness in Jesus, which is what we need to do and say, I've been forgiven so I can act freely. 
we're not doing that and we're afraid to tell the truth to people. Dave, I want to ask you one more thing and I'm going to let you go uh, because you, you just, you have a more rounder, broader understanding of religion than I do. Uh, and so the Mormons, and again, I'm, you don't have to know a lot to know more than me about the Mormons, but I, I suspect you do. And so what I know about the Mormons is that John Smith, I think their founder or whatever, there's some bogusness to what he created. And I don't mean to offend any Mormons, but that's just what I believe. That, and, and that it, at some point, the, the Mormons, part of their religion, had some racism to it where you couldn't become a priest or a bishop or something if you were, were black, until, maybe until 1978 or something, that didn't pass. So I, I get the Mormons' racial history. But here's what, in my lifetime, because I think they changed that in 1978, and, and I get their history, but what my understanding of Mormons is in my lifetime is that, okay, it's, it's there, it, the religion may be heretical, if I, if I use that word properly. Heretical. Yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, but what that religion does do is compel their young people to go on these amazing mission trips all over the world and help people who don't look like them, speak like them, act like them. They go out and evangelize and try to help people all over the world. In little po that's, and again, maybe it's not true, but that's my understanding of the Mormon, that their men at, age, at a certain age go off around the country and do these two-year Mormon missions in faraway countries and try to help people. And so I'm sitting there, now their young people sacrifice two years of their life going out to help people that don't look like them, ain't from where they're from, the whole nine yards. And I'm supposed to believe that those people were sitting in a gym yelling the N-word at a cute little volleyball player from Duke. That's just hard for me to believe. The same kids that sign up to go off to God knows where for two years and live in bamboo huts are the same ones that are at a volleyball arena shouting the N-word at, at a little 19-year-old white girl. It just doesn't make sense to me. And so I, I don't, I, I, whatever I think about the Mormon religion, they're young people and what's instilled in them in terms of how they're trying to help them, they just, it doesn't seem like it's a religion at this point. I don't know what it was previous, that's committed to being racist. Yeah, there was, like you said before, there were things in their past that were definitely problematic that they, uh, they're, I believe they changed their position on later. I, I have to agree with you on the fact of what you said. While Mormonism and Christianity are two separate things, there is definitely a lot that we share on the moral side of things. And they spend these two years going everywhere. They train them extremely well to be able to do what uh, they want them to do as far as their missions and be able to communicate to people. They learn different languages. Um, you know, they give a lot of their life and their energy to try and re recruit people to their religion. So that's definitely the case. And so, but Jason, I don't think it's just them. I don't think that can happen anywhere in America right now. I don't think you can be in a room of 5,000, 2,000, 510 people. If I got on the bus, we should even, it'd be fun to run the experiment. You could not even get on a bus or in public, somebody just walking down the road saying the N word. You, this is not going to happen where that you're going to be allowed rap to concert, be. Rap concert, rap oh, concert at a okay. rap concert All right. well, okay, with black people be, leading. You could not do, with you a white rapper, that, but go ahead. No, you can't be a white rapper doing it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying like, the, but there, I don't even, so I, I, I give you the point that they have such, they do have a very high moral standard and they have care for people that are not themselves. And whatever the racist past was, it isn't currently right now. But I want to broaden that out and say that's not going to be the case in any sort of society in America right now. That's going to be allowed and it's not going to cause a problem. You know, so, yeah, I have to. It's I 
I'd have to be, and I, look, they're doing the investigation. They haven't found any corroborating story or person to say, yeah, I, I, I have a hard time believing this reality. But it reminds me of the Me Too movement, where all you need is the accusation, and that's enough to make you guilty. This is why I go back to due process. We're not living in the world anymore where people are willing to do the research. Jason, I've been watching for this last week. Man, you've been put on a clinic of what it means to be a journalist and to do the research and to dig deep and find the truth. That's something that's lost all the way down to our legal system right now. That's not – we're not doing that anymore. And that should make everybody afraid that there isn't the due process that's being done to say, yes, this was the case. No, it wasn't the case. And now let's make a judgment on what we actually know. We don't have to know anything to make a, a decision on something. Thank you, Dave. Great job, as always. Go to YouTube.com slash Jason Whitlock. Hit notifications, hit subscribe. Eric July. I wanna be, I just wanna, I wanna be, I just wanna, I wanna be, I just wanna. All right, welcome back. Uh, let's catch up with a man uh, that's been kind of in the, I don't know, would you call it the news or the social media news? He's been making waves in the uh, comic book world. Eric July, many of you uh, that follow all of us on The Blaze are well aware of Eric July. Uh, I'm going to get a little bit more up to speed. I've been on uh, the news and why with Eric, with Sarah Gonzalez, but all I really knew about Eric was that he was in a band and he played music and he's kind of a libertarian. I didn't know anything about this whole comic book side of Eric July. And he's being really disruptive uh, in the comic book space. Again, I'm not a comic book guy, uh, but I find all of this fascinating. He's the founder and owner of the Ripperverse, uh, Ripperverse Comics. Uh, so, uh, Eric July, welcome to Fearless. And I want you to educate me and my audience on you and what all you got going on in the comic book space. I just love the fact you're being disruptive. I just love the fact you don't look like, or what I would say, oh, that's a comic book guy. Uh, but you're being very disruptive. So fill me and the audience in on exactly what's been going on. Yeah, a, a lot of people don't know that. And by the way, appreciate you having me on. But a lot of people don't know about that side of me that follow me for different things, be it the band or even the commentary side. But I've been a, I've been a comic book guy for a very long time, even in commentary with comic book stuff. And we've seen the kind of downfall of entertainment definitely recently in terms of the messaging and just the overall content. And I figured this was a great time for someone like myself who is a comic book lifer to – Instead of always griping about the problem, being part of the solution. So I started my own company in Ripperverse Comics where we don't only just do the our own content and original stuff, but also even from the business side with and economic side with distribution. We do all of that as well. And that's something that we want to continue to build up towards. So as you mentioned, we have been very disruptive. Despite me having my little hot takes in the political realm, this is by far the thing that I've got the most backlash on is starting my own comic book company, which tells you what these guys are really uh, really afraid of. Excuse me. So you say the most backlash. Why would there be backlash? Why wouldn't they just welcome you to the space, the more the merrier? Well, what happened was they, particularly like leftists in this country, had long time, long term infiltration of sort of the industry and the entertainment industry. So they got control of it. And of course, they do not like the fact that someone like myself, you mentioned me, me being a, a libertarian, has kind of entered in the space that they think they own. And not only that, yeah, we've entered into the space, we built our own sandbox. So all of the usual tactics that they would use to try to uh, derail someone doing their own thing, they can't really do because, well, I'm the owner. Like Even from our website standpoint, which houses all of our uh, initial like as far as you can purchase the product our own store like that's ours so they can't do anything about this and i think that's part of the frustration that a guy that does not necessarily think like him is doing his own thing and they have no control over but if i was starting this and we didn't see the success that we did 
they probably wouldn't be mentioning us and they wouldn't find it a threat. But it's the fact that we're we're being very competitive. And a lot of cases, what we've been able to do is better, like in just for comparative sake, for you guys that don't know, let's say how, let's say a graphic novel, which is what they would consider this as those the last year, according to Comicron last year, 24,000 copies or it was the number one graphic novel. That's what got you the number one graphic novel, just 20, 20 um, I believe, so 24, 25,000. Well, we destroyed that, and we have accounted for over 25,000, com- uh, excuse me, uh, 50,000, 53,000, I believe is more accurate, book sales. 40,000 total purchases, but 53,000 total book sales. So we've destroyed that by double, and that's why they're mad. And so, again, you got to... Talk to me like a baby, because I am a baby in this space. The, the comic book world is woke and is the same as like the Hollywood movie industry, everything in the comic book space. And give me some examples of, because all of this is kind of new to me, being old, not having kids. I'm right. not aware that the comic book world, but it makes sense. Disney and all the kid movies have gone woke, so it makes sense that the comic book world would follow suit. Yeah, so what we've been dealing with uh, in in this industry is the same exact thing that you've seen in a lot of different um, uh, like aspects of entertainment. I would argue that it happened in the comics before, uh, and then it started to kind of disperse itself into other stuff. So what we saw is various weird things happen. Legendary Iceman, for you guys that know associated with the X-Men, they turned him gay out of nowhere. Like, inexplicably, this was a character that, if anything, was the complete opposite considering his, his previous relationships and all that. So out of nowhere, he is gay. They make him gay. And they started doing weird, odd, bizarre things to a lot of these legacy characters. Uh, recently, you see, like, Tim Drake, uh, who is, no people know him as Robin. They just up and turned him gay. Uh, Superman's son is now gay. Uh, it's just weird stuff like that. And also just beating their audience over the head with a lot of social issues. Issues. We see this recently with the Batman comic where this was basically a stand in for the Antifa types, right? Go in, destroy businesses because they're mad at some sort of form of injustice. Uh, and there was a there was a panel where Batman was, uh, of course, you know, kind of zooming past and he saw them do that. And instead of like using his utility belt and various things that he might have to try to disperse that that crowd, he just goes above it, says, well, they have insurance. Uh, who cares? And it's like, that's not Batman. Batman would never do that. But that's, of course, the views of the person that's writing that story. So that's really all this is. These characters are being used as vehicles for um, the uh, these activists, these leftist activists, and, and they're running and stuff in, into the ground. And so how I caught wind of this is you started crowdfunding, I believe, to put out more content and that caught on like wildfire. People were very supportive of what you were trying to do in the comic book space. Walk us through that. So, yeah, it was actually what we did was we took the transparency of what you generally see with uh, the crowdfunding stuff. So be it like in Indiegogo's Kickstarters, people are trying to raise money. Well, I took the transparency of that. I wanted people to see how much money we're bringing in. I wanted people to see how many people bought this item and all that. People love to see the numbers go up. And I love that. That's what crowdfunding introduced. But I funded it myself. So what I did was after the success that I saw in other avenues, I put about, let's say, 200,000 or so of my own dollars. And I say, let's make it happen. Paid my artists, all that, uh, even the initial printing, all that we paid for ourselves. And uh, thankfully, you know, it was a risk. But thankfully, the audience said, you know what, this is exactly what it is that we wanted. And they supported it by the uh, tens of thousands. And we've uh, we've gotten millions upon millions of, of dollars, which I'm going to be honest with you. Yeah, I expected to see some success, but to this degree, no, not, I did not think, definitely not initially, I did not think we would be doing this. And it just goes to show how much of a demand that there is uh, in this industry in comics where people just don't want this nonsense. They're tired of watching their characters they grew up loving be ran into the absolute ground and they are ready for something new. So we we packaged it well. Our two artists that are 
part of the project and Cliff Richards and Gabe El Taib. These are former Marvel and, and DC guys. These are people that have been part of the industry. So the art looks uh, is very comparable. It's very good. It's uh, the way we packaged it. We took everything serious and we wanted people to see this work and be like, OK, they can get invested in this uh, because it looks like a legitimate, not just some half tailed comic book. This is a legitimate comic book company that is trying to make waves. And I think uh, all that combined just made for the successful pre-order campaign it is that we have. And so these artists, these beautiful sketches I'm seeing work for you or part of your company. Is there's a written part of the comics as well? Is that what you handle? I mean, what's right. the, again, it's been a long time since I've had a comic book in my hand, but isn't part of, there's a story that's being told along with the pictures, correct? Correct. And I'm the writer of that. And so what I did and I just started a company, the first book that we're putting out, I saw him issue number one. I wrote the entire story. All the characters that you see, I designed with my concept artists and the artists, of course, made that come to life. Uh, you have Cliff Richards, who actually saw the, the, the artwork that you that you were being showed. He did all that artwork uh, minus the main cover. But all the interior artwork he did and Gabe El Taib came and colored it. So they did that. That was the art team with the interiors. And I wrote uh, certainly it all. And it's a big shout out to those guys to making that come to life. It was a special moment for me to even see that, uh, you know, something that you you wrote down and seeing how that artist can make that come to life was a very special moment for me. And so a lot of these big uh, Hollywood product produce movies, the Marvel characters and all that, that actually probably starts with a comic book, correct? Because I, I, I saw, I remember a couple years ago, didn't Ta-Nehisi Coates get a deal with Disney or somebody to start writing Marvel? And it, it seemed weird, like Ta-Nehisi Coates was going, and this hardcore leftist, and I was like, okay, they, they must, they're going to do something gay and, and Black Lives Matter related comic or, or something, but am, am I right? And, and he kind of moved into that space and you would kind of be the opposite of that. Correct. Like he moved into the space. And I think that was a big indicator that Marvel was changing because he has no credentials like in this space at all. Like there's no even evidence of him even just talking about comic books, let alone actually being capable of writing or being knowledgeable on these characters. And they didn't just give him Captain America, which he kind of wrote that shot at uh, Jordan Peterson in, but he also wrote Black Panther. So these are two of Marvel's most prominent characters that uh, basically a tourist kind of came in and they gave him the reins to write these very bizarre stories. He wrote this intergalactic Wakanda story. It was terrible. Um, and I talked about that stuff, but that was really a big indicator that this these guys are not sending the best. They're not trying to get the best writers. And there's other writers that are far more capable of doing that. They're getting people that win like the Harriet Beecher Stowe Awards for Social Justice, which is what Ta-Nehisi Coates did. And those are the guys that are writing. These are activists. These aren't actual, actual comic book guys. So I think that's part of the appeal with the Riververse stuff is that I'm a notable comic book guy, mainly as a customer, but doing all this commentary, being knowledgeable on this is a big part of the appeal. So it's not just some venture capitalist that just wanted to make make a little money. No, this is a guy that's starting a company that has has you know been in this industry as a customer for as long as I have been. So I'd like to think that I know what works and certainly uh, what doesn't. And I don't. I'm not interested, even from a liberty perspective. Yeah. It, there's going to be those universal truths that often tie into freedom and, and, and liberty. And these are what these heroes, definitely American heroes, have stood for for decades. But I'm not in the interest of just beating my audience over the head with my individual politics. I think that's what turned a lot of people off for uh, from the actual industry right now. And I'm not I'm not promising to, let's say, beat my audience over the head. In fact, I'm, I'm promising them the opposite. I just want to give you good stories. I want to give you something to get engaged in and sort of sort of lost in. Let me ask you this, Eric, and, and this is the curveball that I wasn't expecting to ask you, but just listening to you talk, there's a Netflix series or Amazon Prime series called The Boys. Mm -hmm. uh, have you seen this? I have not. I know uh, it's uh, based on a comic book stuff, but I, have, I haven't got a chance to actually watch any of that. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm not going to ask you that. <laughs> that <then. laughs> I, I'm, uh, I'm going to pivot to 
you've got a comic book coming out. What's next? Now that you've raised all this money, what's the vision? What's next? Well, of course, uh, now that everybody's placed their pre-orders, we're entering into September. So within the next couple of weeks, people are going to start. Uh, uh, we're going to start the fulfillment, official fulfillment, fulfillment, meaning that all those books, posters, uh, shirts, all those items are going to start going out. So I'm already this isn't like just a get rich quick scheme. I'm already we're 30 pages in almost 40 pages actually, and on ISOM number two. We have a team of a couple of other books that we're working on as well um, that are already in the work. So we're not playing around. Like we are trying to get this content out. We have an entire universe to build. So it's more and more content. And I want to, let's say, expand into other elements. I love to get in like the uh, figure figurine, like um, sculpts, action figure scene as well. And who knows, maybe we move in animation and all that cool stuff as well. But we have to first develop our universe and I want to get, this is something that I want to be comparable. So all that stuff that you see when you associate with Marvel DC, you don't just talk about comics, though they all come from the comics. There's other things that those guys are into. And I would love to enter in those markets as well. But because this is all self-funded, this is our, our sales are basically the investors, right? The customers are the investors. So with that being said, we have to make stuff that people want to buy um, and make stuff come to life. And that's the exciting part of it. And I think, again, that's part of the appeal, that transparency and people having a direct line of sight with myself is huge um, because they know who I am and what I bring to the table. So this company is going to go as far as not only ourselves, but the customers take it. Eric, I I almost hate to ask this question, but but I have to. Uh, are there many people that look like you in this space? Uh, is in in the comic book world and space is this popular among black kids or young younger black people? I'm I'm an old man. I consider you a young man. Uh, so <laughs> I, I'm told. Anyway, are there a lot of minorities in this space? In the space as as customers, a hundred percent. I mean. Definitely, as of recent, it's still a comic, though not necessarily the American produced one, but mangas. Mangas and anime is huge among a lot of um, uh, minority folk. Now, that's my thing where I'm trying to be a competitor. You you got to look at why are people looking to like the Japanese? That's basically what a manga is, a Japanese comic uh, for that sort of appeal and entertainment. I think we need to that says a lot about where the American industry is right now, where people are importing uh, that that the safe form of entertainment and media. But absolutely, there's a lot of them um, that are certainly involved. Now, the problem is, and I felt this, the brunt of this, and people that follow me as well, it's a lot of crab in the bucket mentality that we've seen as well. Like, so I start my own company, and a lot of haters that we got were other black creatives, right? And they were like, they look at it like, oh, he skipped the line type of situation. And it's like, no, nah, I just started my own thing, and it just happened to hit. So there was one, I'm not certainly going to name him on this show, another guy, he considered himself the number one black uh, comic book publisher. That was the moniker that he called himself, <laughs> not anymore. Uh, and he had a, a lot of issues with myself because, well, I had a, he, he saw a picture of me and Kyle Rittenhouse, you know, because Kyle Rittenhouse came to the to News and Why It Matters. I don't know if you remember that. And he was upset at that. He had a lot of issues with that. Oh, he's on Blaze. He's, he's being co-signed by the people that – they hate so much. So I unfortunately got a lot of that, but I will be clear. Guys like Kevin Grievous, he's a Blue Marvel creator, uh, and he's created a lot of his uh, brother, older brother, and I, I love him to death. He's shown a lot of support, and a lot of black creatives have shown a lot of support. But unfortunately, we've also got some, some crab in the bucket type of mentality as well. And then tell me about, there's a YouTube show or podcast where isn't there like like 20 of you guys on all at the same time? And it's very, very popular. Gaston Mooney was telling me about it. Educate me on that. What's the name of that YouTube? Where can I find it? And what are you guys talking about? Because don't y'all draw a pretty massive live audience for that. Yeah, that is averaging. You're, you're referring to Friday Night Tights. And this is on uh, my man's and Erotics channel. Uh, this draws between 10 to 15,000 live viewers every Friday. It is the biggest show in geek culture. And that's just the bottom line. Now, 
a lot of people are upset with that. Definitely the access media types because they do their own thing and they can't draw anywhere near it. But what it is, it shows is a breakup in kind of how the legacy media does. You expect it like the IGNs of the world and, and all those nerd sort of culture, corporate entities to do what they do. But what this is an example of is just a bunch of regular people. We don't have access. We're not the ones getting uh, paid to shield for these Hollywood elites or the latest video games or the latest comic books books. We don't do that. They would never invite us to that stuff. Anyway, we just give it to them objectively. And, and, you know, if it sucks, we, we tell them that, and it's drawn this big audience. I'm one of the guys that kind of came up in that as well, talking about like comic book and other forms of entertainment where, yeah, it's not the uh, access. We don't, we're not the ones that you're going to maybe see on Rotten Tomatoes uh, as critics or anything, but we get to just give people our opinion and it's not corporate. It's not pretty. Uh, but it's drawn such a massive audience, and that's the power of what the Internet has given us, and that we have a direct line of sight with our customers, direct line of sight with our audience, and it's far more authentic than what anything that the corporate press and the corporate media, access media, are giving them. So fri uh, shows like Friday Night Tice is also Tuesday Night's main event, which is kind of a similar format, where a bunch of us regular guys just come talk together about nerd, geek culture stuff, but it's not controlled, and that's a huge appeal. Are you still making music? And yeah, that's one of the big questions that I get. Yes. So backwards, my band, we came, uh, we were in a studio probably, uh, that was like about two months ago we were there. We recorded a new stuff. We're sitting on, believe it or not, like 15 to 20 tracks that are unreleased. And I know so many people are waiting for that. And that's the awesome thing about what the Ripperverse stuff has introduced. A lot of people don't know Alex is our acting CFO uh, in Ripperverse Comics. He's the second vocalist <laughs> and the bassist for our band. Our video editor is Brian who is the guitarist in our band. So I got two more guys that I got to bring on board and all the backwards will be a part of the Ripperverse as well. And that's been a good feeling, but we've been working on a lot of content uh, that we are going to have prepared for you guys. And I know so I get that's the number one question. When is, are we going to get some new backwards music? And that'll be very, very, very soon. Definitely once we get this campaign, the first campaign done, start fulfillment and get the wheels churning. I think a lot of people are going to be stoked to see some new music and it's heavy. I can't wait to get it out. We'll, we'll end on this note. And I didn't prepare you for this. Uh, but what's your hottest, hottest political take at the moment? Oh, hottest political take, man. The one that got, I guess that gets me the most trouble is in regards to, let's say, affirmative action and like things such as the Civil Rights Act of 1964. I've talked about this extensively on my channel and various, I've done long form videos talking about how those are some of the most worst laws that exist because they're anti-private property rights laws. Now you like to think of those laws as things that are net positive, definitely when you consider the era that they were uh, implemented. But when you think about it, it was the opposite of what should have happened. When you look at the South, for example, and Jim Crow laws, I think a lot of people mistake a lot of, hey, here's the sign that says I don't want to serve to this type of minority as something that businesses were doing just unanimously on their own accord. And that couldn't be anything further from the truth. When you look at things like Plessy versus Vergs in the uh, classic Supreme Court case, and you look at the Louisiana boxcar uh, company, right? And that company in the South was uh, a, a company that was having to abide by that Louisiana, that separate boxcar act, I think is the act, exact law. And that company that was even involved in that case, believe it or not, did not want to separate blacks from whites or the colored folk from the white folk. They didn't want to do that. But the law forced them to actually do that. Money talks. Think about it. They have to purchase more boxcars if they have to separate their, their patrons or the people that are buying uh, uh, tickets to whatever uh, uh, go travel. So they didn't want to do that, yet the government was forcing them to do that. So you would think that the thing to do would be, hey— Let's like not have those laws be in, in existence. Those are anti-private property rights laws. Well, you overcorrect it in having something like the affirmative action laws that we often have, as well as the other laws that are associated with civil rights in that they basically say that you as a private property right owner cannot do with your property what you want to do. My argument is that 
Hell, if I see someone on, uh, or I'd rather that, let's say, racist person tell me flat out they don't want my money. What those laws allow these racists to do is hide behind it. So now you probably may be giving your money to someone that absolutely hates you, but it's illegal for them to absolutely tell you. I'd rather know, hey, you don't want my money? Awesome. I don't want to line your pockets up either if you hate me. So that those laws that exist have made a, 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 a lot of errors uh, or created a lot of errors going into the future because it was an overcorrection of these despicable uh, racist laws that were unfortunately uh, placed upon a lot of business owners. Eric, awesome to have you on. Uh, we'll have you back as you uh, fill us in more on the success of Ripperverse. Uh, I'm going to follow up with you in private because I got an idea that, that may help you, may be of assistance to you in what you're doing. Uh, so I'll, I'll hit you privately on that. But thank you so much for the time. Uh, appreciate it. All I right, appreciate I think I hear so tomorrow. That means we will see you tomorrow. Freedom. Look for a breakout, feeling like a standoff, nothing in life like freedom. Came like a fighter, striking like a ladder, making all this moves for freedom. I want freedom. No negotiation, my sister, no relation, we all just want to have freedom. Sitting on the corner, never been alone, I'm breaking my back for freedom. Bless, we are living, get back, we are receiving all the seeds when we all want to be free. We want freedom. I just want, I want to be, I just want.